Um, you know, Dick is a really the first milestone on my personal lean journey. Uh, when I started at um, Hewlett Packard as a manufacturing engineer back in the early 90s, um, you know, I went to HP because I heard that they were this really great world class company, and I thought, boy, I'm just going to learn so much while there. Well, son of a gun, you know, when I started working in manufacturing there, it was fighting fires and running around, and you know, nobody seemed to really know to know what to do. And I started asking around and said, well, what, you know, what, what do we do about this sort of thing? I said, well, somebody pointed out, you should read this book by this guy named Dick Schauberger. He wrote a book called World Class Manufacturing, and he thought, you know, that I find it, you know, relatively interesting. And uh, son of a gun, he was right. So I, I read that book. Um, that led to some brown bag lunches where I had my engineering team reading that book, which led to some improved performance by my engineering team. I got a lot of recognition within the division, and eventually that recognition in the division led to me a job as a worldwide manufacturing education manager for Hewlett Packard's components group. And because I then had that position, I could then invite Dick Schomberger to come to talk to us, you know, in person. So I got the pleasure of both traveling around to some HP sites with Dick Schomberger and uh, learning from him firsthand. I gotta say, not only is he a smart guy that, that knows this stuff, um, he really sort of tells it like it is. You know, it's not just sort of parrying back what he's heard from Toyota or what people are saying. You know, he tells the truth and he's also a really nice guy. So with that, uh, let's give a hand for Dick Schomberger. Memories, good memories. Because uh, HP was, uh, in my opinion, ahead of every other company in the world in implementing what we now call uh, lean manufacturing. This was in the 1980s, and then with uh, with uh, Eric in the 1990s. Uh, I was walking up here this morning, and I walked by a couple of guys who were sweeping the concrete in order to repair it or something like that. And I just, I just couldn't help saying, we needed you in, in uh, Sochi. Because our, 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 uh... <laughs> 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 yeah, and they said, yeah, we're going to. Well, uh, I couldn't even remember. Somebody asked me last night at, at Eric's house, uh, what's the title of your, uh, presentation. I couldn't remember it. I had I came up with some other title. But, uh, I, I talk a, a lot of, uh, about lean in many different guises, accounting, resources, and even marketing a little bit. Uh, but this one has to do with the uh, biggest problem in most companies, at least people say that, is getting high level executive support that, uh, that's there and can and sustain itself. And uh, to me, it's a matter of getting, make, building the whole thing up to uh, where it is considered to be strategic and not just operational. So let's take a look. By the way, uh, uh, some of this comes from the research, big research project that I did that culminated in this book, uh, Best Practices in Lean Six Sigma Process Improvement, with help, a deeper look with telling evidence from the lean and studies. Uh, when, when, uh, when Publisher and I were kicking around the title, uh, I was a little bit by what they chose as the title. Because I said, uh, Lean Six Sigma, there are dozens of, of uh, titles, maybe maybe hundreds of titles like that out there. What, what this is really about is the deeper look with telling evidence from the research project. So why don't you get that up at the main title? And uh, the answer from my editor was, well, Dick, uh, these days, it's for marketing, we, we have to have key words in the main title. And I thought about that a minute, and I said, aha, uh -huh, I see what you mean. Uh, how about this for a title? Best Practices in Lean Six Sigma Sex. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I really didn't say that. It's one of those things you think of after it's too late. But anyway, this is the book, and, and it's got the innocuous title that they selected, the, the clean version. Uh, the, the big problem here is uh, multiplied in just about every aspect of running an enterprise that you can think of. Woes, lean woes. 
weak recognition of needs primary purpose and that has to do with the customer. We're thinking narrowly, we should be thinking strategically and competitively and that means customer. So many product models and suppliers and customers you can't even find the value stream. This is proliferation, big proliferation problem. I know I have uh, two or three slides on deproliferation, but I doubt that I'll get to that. I have a lot of buffer stock in my presentation just in case uh, there's more time than I thought. But uh, I always used to do this for years and years. I was giving these one and two day seminars and people would get nervous uh, in the afternoon and they say, I, I gotta catch a plane. Uh, how long is this going to take? Or it's gonna snow and I gotta, we, we have to get in our car, right? So I always told them, uh, when, it's, when it's time to quit, I'm done. Even if the last word is the word the, or something like that, I stop. So that'll probably happen. We'll stop before I'm done, but I'm done. <laughs> Persistent wrong-headed financial hurdles and, and problems. Uh, things going wrong everywhere, all the time, and no systematic recording of the wrongs. The recording of the wrongs we, we, uh, we put off until uh, a project team is formed. That should be going on all the time. It, it's the Dr. Deming approach, a continuous collection of process data. Everything that goes wrong is documented and recorded. We are doing that. Dr. Deming dies and everybody forgets. 95% of the improvements done by 5% of the total of capable people. And that's, that's a big problem. Level production obsession when the greater need is for flexible reaction to yo-yo demands that are always out there. I just had a two-part article uh, 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 really criticizing excessiveness in tack time performance, tack time objectives. That was in uh, Target Magazine. Lots more. Here's some postulates uh, to, to, to get it right. Of lean-based process excellence. Uh, Quick, no waiting response. That's really what it's all about. That's, that is the essence of lean, the way I think anyway. It's the greatest benefit because it, uh, it, it's, it's dominant in the uh, minds and eyes of customers, any, uh, service or, or manufacturing. In the value chain, there's a, a, a chain of customers. The next customer is, is uh, waiting for the previous one with uh, the problems to be solved at the previous step and so forth. And then it exposes quality and all other problems while the causes are still active, while you have a chance of finding out what they really are. That's about as important as anything else. Quick, quick finding of, of causes of problems. Uh, process problem inventory is, is right in there as a dominant uh, variable because in, inventory magnifies all problems. Inventory and all the lead times go with us. Reducing inventory is highly beneficial, but only if you're solving process problems. Just reducing inventory willy-nilly, well, you can't, ship it. you can't can't serve customers anymore. By the way, the customer's inventory in a lot of the services. The customer is the thing that's waiting for, for uh, responsibilities. Excellent quality, can't, you can't do anything without it. Uh, and then fixing broken quality and fixing broken uh, lean are big problems. A lot of companies uh, suddenly have a big recall and big, uh, maybe even lawsuits on their hands. Uh, quality, we know how to fix. It takes a long time, but we know about quality engineering and testing and, and uh, quality assurance and so forth. Fixing broken lean is more difficult, believe it or not. We don't know. Uh, uh, much about how to fix it, except that it requires retraining of everybody avidly for a long time. Anyway, uh, this is the top one is the main objective of lean. Uh, far more relevant in actually in the services than in manufacturing, because services, a lot of them are, are up right next to the customer. So you feel the pain of, of uh, being slow, being delayed. Advantage uh, goes to customer facing human services then. Uh, there's terminology involved here, let's just take a look at it. Just in time is the name that we, is the previous name to what we now call lean. 
just-in-time production in the 1980s changed to lean manufacturing and later lean management in the 1990s, primarily because of the publication of the book uh, uh, that introduced the word lean. So anyway, uh, just-in-time and now called lean was developed in Japan in the 1960s. Uh, by the 1970s was perfected, and by the 1980s was shipped to the rest of the world. Uh, my first book was called Japanese Manufacturing Techniques, Nine Hidden Lessons in Simplicity. Uh, and that was 1982. I was writing articles and, and delivering lectures and so on in 1980 and 1981, and finally became a, a book. So we ought to, uh, excuse me, total quality control uh, dates way back. 1961, uh, a book by that title by Arnon, Arman Wiegelbach. JIT morphed into Lean, okay, uh, total quality management uh, in 1960, 1965, and that was uh, Ishikawa's book. I can't see this. Yeah, that's better. Uh, total quality control and total quality management more unfortunately away from the, the quality sciences and uh, it kind of got, got taken over by the organizational behavior people in the name of teaming. So TQM became teaming and lost the, the uh, real quality essence of it. Just in time production morphed into just in time inventory. The news media doesn't recognize the term just-in-time production or just-in-time manufacturing or just-in-time management. They only think these days that it's uh, something to do with the suppliers. Six Sigma was developed by Motorola in 1986 and that's based on the quality sciences happily. Lean and Six Sigma merged in the 2000s. It's not been a, 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 a very effective merger in many respects. But anyway, it's there, and it's good. It's good that there is that word. The essence of all of these above, all these terms and concepts and techniques and methodologies uh, is, is continuous process improvement. In what sense? What, what do you mean? Uh, improvement in what? Well, uh, these are, are, are sort of the, the four horsemen. Ever quicker, more flexible, higher quality, higher value, all along the chain of customers. Here's some service examples. This, uh, I actually took this photograph at the uh, place where I used to bank. And this is an example of ever quicker response at Seacrest Bank, the interchange to Bank of America. Uh, this, uh, what you see in the picture here is a clock. And just below it, it says uh, it's a five minute $5 promise. If you have to wait for a teller for as long as five minutes, you get $5. I think I got the last $5 out of that bank. <laughs> they have taken down the sign and changed to a new program. And I asked, I, I, I measured it, and I asked it, uh, I said, you still pay $5 for five minutes? I took more than five minutes. They paid me $5. So anyway, uh, the objective here is Q time, or Q, Q length reduction. That's, that, that's uh, the same in manufacturing as in services. You want the queue time to go down. You want the length of the queue to go down. Ever quicker and more flexible. This is an example from Atlantic Envelope Company, which makes contract envelopes of all sizes and types and volumes and so on. Uh, two cross-trained co-located clerks are behind that partition. And they have driven the... Uh, <laughs> order processing time to get the order from planning into production uh, from one week to one day. And actually, what you see in the picture there, they plotted themselves the results of Thursday. On Thursday, they processed 47 orders in 7.9 hours. So they have taken over the monitoring of their own performance. They're cross-trained, that's why it's called flexible. And that's instead of four different departments taking a whole week to get the order done. And then you can see there's a January plot there and a 
February one, and this is the March plot of their own performance. There isn't any gold on there. I, I very much like what uh, uh, Shelley Sweet said this morning. She said, uh, you don't really have to have gold, but everybody does it. We're gold happy these days. There is, a, in the field of management, a subfield that is attacking the idea of goal, uh, of, of management by goals. I've communicated with those uh, academics a little bit on this, and they had no idea that, that uh, what they were thinking of could apply in other contexts. But anyway, we don't need a goal. You don't need a goal, you just need a, a, a line, a trend line. It's going in the right direction, that means it's good. It's going up at a sharp angle, that's better. Don't need managers to set goals. Here's another example. This is from Northwest Hospital in Seattle. This is Debbie's Dugout. It was a little room that used to be a closet right off uh, one of the surgical suites. And uh, the way it was told to me when I was there, I have a, had a photograph, I lost a photograph. But anyway, uh, the way it was told to me was, uh, Nobody could remember a surgery starting on time. So Debbie took, took uh, this upon her, this uh, challenge upon herself, and, and uh, she, she put, the, put up this chart every day, a new chart, or maybe two times a day, I don't know. And uh, it's a who's late chart. So the check mark is Dr. Vickery here. Dr. Vickery was late. Dr. Vickery is, is uh, uh, receiving very bad advice about this and he'll never be late again. <laughs> That's the power of visual management. Measuring quick response, how do you do it? Well, you either have to come or you have the time. And uh, she Shelley probably mentioned that this morning. That's, that's how you do it. But it's cumbersome to time things. So, uh, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't occur automatically unless you have automated machines or something. So it's, it's a, it is the most important measure, the important measure in lean, and yet it's cumbersome to, to use. I can envision a, a, a time in the future, maybe not the far distant future, when uh, hospital patients at random will be given a little uh, uh, visual device, a handheld visual device, and they will time their own frustration. And, and make comments on their little device, whatever it is. I could envision the same thing in uh, new car sales, where you go into the sale and to look at some cars, and the salesman is all over you trying to tell you on that car. Uh, but uh, no information about what you like or don't like about that car ever gets back to the manufacturer. So I can envision, uh, instead of a salesman using uh, pressure techniques on you, giving you a little device like, like in the hospital. And you record everything that the, the uh, staff there tells you, record everything you don't like about this car. Uh, it is not for our benefit here at the dealership. We're sending all that information back to Chrysler. And Chrysler is the first company in the world, in the automo automobile world, that is getting information from the customer about what you don't like about their car. I actually proposed this to uh, uh, a salesman, and I said, I'll, I'll buy you lunch. I'll tell you about how, how to do this. Uh, you'll make a name for yourself, but he, he wouldn't come to lunch with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, units or time waiting tells a lot. It's visible, countable, it's comparable. That's why I've been able to do a massive research project about this, however, I can't use time, be, and I don't have to because, well, I'll tell you about this in a few minutes, but there's another very objective source that, that is like time. It's a hiding place for a multitude of hills, and it lengthens discovery time, I already talked about that. Uh, lean and Six Sigma process improvement should work better, as I was saying, in services than in manufacturing. Let's just take a look at the two sides of this. Manufacturing has a big, major disadvantage, and, and I think this has a lot to do with what goes wrong with lean in manufacturing companies. Disconnect with the customer. Most people never see a customer in, in manufacturing. So uh, 
that very important uh, linkage is lost. The feedback is lost. As a result, main focus shifts from effectiveness, customer value, to efficiency, waste reduction. Process improvement shifts from continuous to intermittent. And in services, there, there's this great motivational advantage. Customers often, are often seen, especially in the aspect of human services where you are actually looking the customer in the eye and they're looking at you. And, and, uh, but but uh, in most service organizations, the, the feeder processes and the after after service process aren't that far away either, either in time or in in uh, geography. But services uh, are are losing this advantage, are badly losing this advantage because they're learning, they're, they're taking most of their training from manufacturing, and manufacturing is all fouled up in many ways. And partly part of the reason is they don't see customers. Let's take a look at this focus on waste that's so, so characteristic, almost a definition of lean in, in manufacturing. It's become that, that extreme. To gain and keep executive level support, you have to get the cart. If you have to get the horse in front of the cart, the, the, the horse is the customer ought to be out in front. But the focus on waste reverses it. So, uh, lean must put the customer first. And, and marketing is, is your uh, connection to the customer, so put marketing first. What, do, what, does, what does marketing care about lean? Nothing. If anything, uh, marketing and sales are antagonistic toward lean. Uh, they, they, they see it as uh, taking away our company car and things like that. Uh, so, so if you, if, you get, if you get marketing on board, you've got the company on board in a lot of cases. How do you get marketing on board? You sell them on the idea that, that lean primarily delivers quicker, more flexible response to your customers out there. Would you, wouldn't you like to have that? Instead of just the four P's of marketing, product, price, place, and promotion. I'll set, add, add to those four, uh, speed, quality, flexibility, and value. Waste elimination is a great idea, easily taught to the troops, and we should continue doing it avidly, but it's an enabler, it's not the primary, it's not the definition. Customer first upgrades mean from operational to competitive and therefore strategic. There's terminology involved here again, uh, lean, Six Sigma, TPS, SCM, all that. Uh, is seen uh, by senior people as at the, at the extreme headcount reduction, for heaven's sake. But anyway, operational and tactical. There might be a time for a new term. Instead of calling it lean, it's a, it's a little bit tired anymore, anyway, as a term. Maybe we should adopt one like time based competition. And that kind of brings us back to the way. It was promoted in various cases. Oh, here's one more thing. A, a European healthcare group is rejecting terms even like lean and waste and promoting the phrase more time to care. Time, time, time. We gotta get back to thinking of lean in terms of time. Stock wrote an article, one of the most widely uh, quoted articles of the 1980s in Harvard Business Review called Time the Next Source of Competitive Advantage. Harvard Business Review doesn't want to print anything that doesn't have a, a strategy uh, connection to it. So, so uh, this is right there for executives. And uh, Thomas and the Thomas Group of Consulting were all over the place uh, with, with his book called Getting Competitive Middle Managers in the Cycle Time Ethic. And now it's Surrey. Surrey is in all the news magazines because of his book and articles and consulting company in Milwaukee. It's about time and competitive advantage of quick, quick response manufacturing. He's got his own little thing, QRP, quick response manufacturing, Q, QM, no, QR, QRM, excuse me. 
Also, there's many books with just in time in the title, including even one of mine. Uh, World Class Manufacturing Casebook Implementing JIT and GQC 1987. That casebook, which uh, I'll brag a little bit, has sold uh, more than 30,000 copies, mainly to industry. Uh, they tell me it's the largest selling casebook of any kind. Um, and it even had a case in there uh, uh, of applications in a hospital and in an administrative setting and even in engineering. What I use just in time in engineering. Well, it's, it's the old whole for release file that is well known in manufacturing. You don't release another project until you finish one already. So avoiding proliferation of projects out there. Uh, in uh, Stock's book, 1990, there's case study examples from Honda, Toyota, Harley Davidson, Millican, Federal Express, and Walmart, all famous for speed, 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 in serving customers. In, uh, in goods, Walmart, I think, is the most innovative, lead, uh, has the most innovative and thorough lead expertise of any, of any uh, more so than any manufacturing company. And uh, Millican might be uh, one of the champions of quality in the whole world. Let's take a look at this big research project that I've been working on since 1994, I guess, when I only had a few companies in the Seattle area and a, a few from the UK and a few from, from France. And now it's up to 1,600 companies. And all the data comes from annual reports for publicly held companies. The whole idea here is uh, to, to uh, look at why, uh, wh which, which companies and sectors and parts of the world are failing in lean and why, and then which are succeeding and why. So a, a 1,600, uh, not just manufacturers, but also distributors and retailers, because they're the customers of manufacturers. The measure of merit is inventory. Why? Because it's available and it's objective. <laughs> And it's measured the same way worldwide. And uh, inventory is the correlate, correlate of inventory is wait time. Customers, patients, clients waiting impatiently to be served because there's inventory in the way. Goods waiting to be ordered and made and shipped. Uh, also, nearly every process improvement reduces reliance on inventory. You don't need it anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go over the whole sc uh, scoring scheme here. I'll just show you a couple of examples. There are 1,600 uh, PowerPoint graphs of all these companies with at least 15 years of data. And uh, what you do is you take a look at the graph and then you say, well, two points, one point, half, minus half point, or something like that. But it all works out to uh, these scores. The Nordic countries had the highest scores in the world uh, a few years ago, and then uh, Germany, Austria, United States, about average, and so on down the line. Uh, the sample size is indicated there. And the trend line, the trend line in all these regions is down except for Japan. Japan was so far lower than all the rest of the, of the uh, countries of the world that it's, uh, finally they are the one now that in the 2000s, is showing improvement. And even that wouldn't show up at all if it weren't for electronics companies in Japan that have finally uh, begun to care about profits <coughs> and inventory buildups in the face of not enough demand and all that sort of thing. In 2003, the scores were way higher. Look at those scores, 1.09, 1.2, and so forth. Uh, so it, it's, it's uh, an indicator that, that uh, industry is not doing very well on lean. And uh, just in the last uh, about three or four weeks, I've uh, uh, looked at annual reports for all of the Nordic countries. Some of them don't have their new annual reports out yet, so it could be 2012 data or 2013 data. And their score is down again, 0.4, and the U.S. score is down 0.42, France down to 0.26. So it's, it's getting, still getting worse. 
Here is uh, the, the regressive tendencies for the three biggest automakers in the world, Toyota, General Motors, and Ford. And uh, you can see that this is inventory turnover. It's cost of goods sold from the numerator in the numerator divided by the value of inventory in the denominator. And we want the, the uh, inventory turnover to go up, up, up. And it did for a long time for all three of those companies. But in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, it's down, down, down. That means they are getting unlean. They are losing their leanness. Sure, sure, part of the reason is globalization. It extends the global uh, 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 channel, delivery channels, but that can't be the whole reason. And if it is, then something's wrong with your strategy. If you're building uh, plants that are too far away and you can't serve them properly, then there's something wrong with your strategy. So anyway, the auto industry and Toyota are not good role models for leanness. Uh, I know there are people from SSAB here. Where's the SSA? One or two per people here. Well, SSAB is a Swedish company and they're in the, the uh, basic metal processing industry. And it's the green line there. It's going down a little bit. That's going down is, is not good. But it's, uh, the, the last two or three years are up. So I think the score, the grade on this would be, uh, the score is minus one half point. The grade is C plus. And then Zodiac, where's the Zodiac? Yeah, okay. This is your company, your French owner company. And uh, you get a C, a grade of C. That means there's no clear, absolute trend. So anyway, that's the point. All of these 1,600 graphs are scored in grade. And it's not your fault, I know. It's, it's a fresh and good. That's a big uh, I've also uh, taken all of these data for the US and also for, for Japan and tracked it. Is there, is there any kind of pattern here? And yes, there is a pattern. The US data, U.S. data goes back all the way to 1950 for many companies. And by 1962 or three, the sample size was large enough, like over 100 companies, where uh, the average is meaningful. And uh, from, from the 1960s down to about 1975, the 1975 was the worst year in modern history for U.S. industry in terms of leanness, inventory turnover. That's when we bottomed up. And then uh, JIT came along, and uh, JIT to the rescue, and the inventory returns on average went up. And then, I don't know why, but you can call it JIT fatigue. About that time, we needed lean. We needed a name change. Companies were tired of it, and so we got a new name, and sure enough, the inventory returns went up again in the U.S., and then since 2000, uh, been getting worse again. Japan, I don't have uh, data going way back there, but I think probably it was going up, 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 then it went down, then it plateaued, and now finally it's going up again. Has quality followed a similar pattern? How, how many of you think, uh, yes, maybe, or uh, how many think maybe quality has followed a pattern like this? Yeah. Some of you do. I, I'm not sure. I don't know, but I worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Will Lean Six Sigma and services follow a similar pattern? I don't know, but I think so. Symptoms of weak executive interest because not seen as strategic as major reasons? Yeah, I think so. Actually, Quality uh, Digest in May 2008 had an art front uh, cover story, Bored by Lean. Lean in its close surrogate uh, inventory. Well, uh, Lean's main benefits reduce wait times everywhere. Uh, find problems before they fester. A halt dependence on age deteriorating item forecasts. And inventory of cash basin for a multitude of ills standing in the way of that. Okay. Keep in mind now that the inventory is a very convenient, widely available, uh, standard measure, 
but it, it's it's just a surrogate for what is really what really counts, and that's wait time, wait time, and wait length. Inventory is but an echo. Inventory reductions must come from intensive management of the basics. Inventory reduction as a managed goal fails. It's easily manipulated. It must be uh, the result of improvements. So I, I would like to uh, request your aid right now to uh, take the pledge. I'd like all of you to repeat after me, we will not set inventory goals. Everybody, we will not set inventory goals. One more time, we will not set inventory goals. Because Here's why, because inventory goes away by itself. It goes away when you cross-train the workforce, when you make the supplier a partner, when you uh, uh, reorganize the resources into cells, use quick setup, use five messes, use uh, TPM, all that stuff. Every one of those things causes inventory to go away by itself. Anyway, thank you for taking the pledge. <laughs> Even though some of you probably have your fingers crossed. <laughs> Primary uh, drivers of leading, I, I was an academic for a long time, and uh, I, I never get the chance to ask, to ask multiple choice questions anymore. And so, so I thought I'd throw one in here. Which of the following lean manufacturing methodologies is most important and effective? I think you'll recognize that all of them are important and effective, but which is the most important and effective? And I'm not going to ask you to vote on it because I know what the answer is going to be. 90% of you are going to vote for D, value stream mapping, and that is the wrong answer. And why is that the wrong answer? Because I'm the teacher and I said so. <laughs> the right answer, it turns out, is cellular manufacturing. But let me explain here why it can be value stream mapping. Uh, Eric Olson and I, back in the early 1990s, were involved in, in many, uh, uh, if, if, we, if we weren't involved in many very successful lean implementations ourselves, we were reading case study after case study after case study from all over the world. And uh, that was be before the term value stream mapping had been developed. There was a, a predecessor to that that everybody was familiar with and using. It was reorganizing the facility it, it, by families of customers or families of products. And that really is the essence of, mo most of the essence of value stream man mapping. But we never mapped the process. We never mapped the present process, and we never mapped the uh, future one. We just went ahead and did it. That's not to say that I'm, I, I don't mean to cast aspersions on value stream mapping. It's a great technique. It's, wonder, it's wonderful that it was developed, but it is overemphasized. We spend too much time on planning things and analyzing processes and not enough time doing it. So let's see what's so good about cellular manufacturing. It's, it's a, a, a process, if you want to call it that, that partially manages itself. A work cell, the standout feature of the is where you bring scattered processes all over the place uh, with, with these spaghetti diagrams. Uh, you bring them together in a compact cell. Uh, way back in the early 1990s, I took, uh, I don't know, 70, 80, 90 uh, Microsoft administrative people up to Snoqualmie Falls for a day of training and so forth. And uh, in a breakout group, they came back with a solution that is cells. The solution was the, the uh, uh, separation of the three major components of buying computers. They were buying about a thousand computers per month at that time, and they weren't, weren't getting any discounts. <laughs> so uh, they uh, kicked it around and they said, here's the problem, we got the buyers over here in one building, we've got the accounts payable over there in another building, and we've got receiving way over in, in some park somewhere off-site. Uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to move a buyer or two and an accounts payable person or two into the receiving building. That's a little sell. And, and ever after, they were able to uh, very quickly go through the whole thing and get quantity discounts. 
So anyway, that's the idea. Cellular organization and layout relies on cross-training, job rotation, broad pay bands sometimes are necessary. Enables job enlargement and enrichment, increases the company skill bank, reduces absenteeism and all that sort of thing, and upgrades the culture, upgrades performance management. Here's an example of what we don't like. Somebody doing one thing all day, over and over, over and over, not having any connection to the other part of making a shirt. She's just making, I don't know, the left sleeve or something, and then and it sits in another big queue and goes to the right sleeve department, and then the bottom hand department, and so forth, and it takes uh, how many weeks to make a shirt? So the, the solution to that is all in the apparel industry, and they look like this one in, uh, in Iowa, uh, nearly zero inventory and cycle time. Nobody's sitting down. It's very unhealthy. Can you imagine sitting there all day, like that previous example from China, uh, where the cycle time was probably uh, 10 seconds or less, which is equivalent to repeating the same motion about 3,000 times a day. I call that the cycle of oh, very short cycle jobs of any kind. We shouldn't allow it. They shouldn't be allowed by, by the regulatory agencies and the government <laughs> that are responsible for health and safety. A mindlessly boring job, ergonomic repetitive motion problems, high employee turnover for both of those reasons, and uh, no employee involvement, there's no time. And no intrinsic reward, it's just uh, we, give, we give you a pay and, and travel to the massive uh, factory and, and so forth. High hiring and training costs, uh, so what, these are low wage people, well, uh, you, you hire somebody, I'm thinking of uh, Mexico and China where most of the people who work in the maquiladoras and, and big factories in China, came from small villages, are scared to death, or mostly the young girls, they get a job, uh, and, 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 uh, but they have to go through an eight uh, day or, or two week or three week training, and then they can't stand the job, they leave uh, two weeks later. <laughs> and, and there's something worse than there's prop performance problems and cost competitive problems, but here's maybe the worst problem of all, no friendships. The, uh, the, the, the scarce young woman who takes a job at a, a, a company that makes cell phones or something like that uh, starts to make a friend, the girl on the right or the girl on the left elbow, and that, that girl can't stand the place anymore and leaves just about when the friendship is hatching. So anyway, a lot of things wrong with short cycle jobs of any kind. So that's why we cross-train people, and we, we expect people to trade jobs off. If you just cross-train them and you don't uh, have job rotation frequently, you, you've missed the uh, biggest advantage of it. And then there are self-managed uh, self, self attributes, that frequent job rotation, there's no, with, with very little inventory, there's no place for a slacker to hide. <laughs> There's peer pressure, so there's no need for supervisors in many cases. If, if, uh, if you've got a cell that is handing off from one person to the next in the cell, and Stacy is pulling her weight, everybody is on her case right away. She shakes up or she ships out. <laughs> Self-management, little need for management controls and controllers, and maybe even no, no even uh, necessary performance reviews. Everybody rates everybody else. Cell teams and operators plot their own perfume and, uh, performance on their own graphs, trend charts, with photos, and that's self-gratifying. We don't need management to say, oh, you're doing a great job because you're, we like that. We like customers to roam around and should we well show them the charts too. E equipment, let me see. Oh, I, I just got quickly. I was waiting for you to say the. I, I was going to quit in the middle of my sentence here. <laughs> I, I just didn't have to show it. I just have to show it. Uh, this time I'm going to tell you the answer also. Every product, every day. It turns out that the e, e is the most important. 
Nobody is doing this in manufacturing. Here's an example of the worst case, it's bottling plants. In, the, in any one of these three bottling plants, maybe Coca-Cola or water or beer, uh, there, there will be at least 500 different stockkeeping units that they produce there on three production lines. Three very costly, very complex production lines. This is a violation of the concurrency concept. The concurrency concept says tr try to make every product every day at the same time. You can't do it if you have only three production lines, and that's a major, major uh, efficiency of the way we, we set up and, and run factories. So we need to get rid of the math. This is a, an example of, of, of a modern-day monument. Lean, lean, uh, says monuments are bad. It's the old style. It makes big, big quantities of things and is inflexible. These are monuments in their modern day equivalents. So anyway, uh, I, I think you get the picture here. It's not just in the beverage industry, but it is most in, in most of the packaged goods industry to some extent. Maybe even in in uh, sunmade. Where's the sunmade people? There you are. I, I'd love to visit your plant. <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there. I know you have this little uh, pass on and it's got some, some uh, additional slides that I didn't get time for. But uh, thank you very much for your attention and good luck to all of you.